Now, from the highlands in the heart of Borneo to densely populated west coast of Malay Peninsula, Malaysia is pushing to modernize its agriculture food industry through sustainable farming practices. Now, this is CNA correspondent. Deep in the heart of Bonio Island is home to some of the world's most diverse rainforests, and its highlands still hold many treasures waiting to be discovered. Now, indeed, many places in interior Sabah and Sarawak are not easily accessible by road. It will take hours, if not days. Now, this it's a public transport. Domestic flights are not frequent. Only small planes like this twin otter turboprop flies the route and the seats are limited. Now, each flight can only take up to nine passengers. Located some 900 metres above sea level, Bakkalala is home of the Lunbawang ethnic minority in Sarawak, famed for their specialty rice, Baras Ada. And the airport is located at the main village, Budok Nur. Hi, welcome to Bakalalan, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. It's my first trip to Bakalalan, and I can't wait to meet the local farmers. Jeffrey Dada, whose family has been in rice farming for generations, greeted me at the airport. It's post harvesting season, and Jeffrey was happy to show me around. His family's paddy fields are located at Long Rusu, one of the nine villages in Bakalala. Four-wheel drive is a must to negotiate the mountainous terrains. And most farmers in Bakalala, he said, are still using the traditional rice farming method that doesn't rely on commercially produced fertilizers or pesticides. Paddies are harvested only once a year in December. The planting season begins in July or August. Till then, the land and buffaloes get to rest, while the soil recovery takes place using green manure and organic compost. There are just over 1,000 Lumbawang people in Bakalalan, where paddy field is their home and rice their pride. Bakalalan Adan rice uh, is uh, unique and it is, uh, you know, uh, different in terms of texture in terms of taste and uh, quality from other rice that are produced in, in uh, neighboring uh, villages. Farmers are used to their traditional ways of farming that makes extensive use of indigenous knowledge. <laughs> She's calling for the wind to come help her. Others use a different technique to separate husks from the paddies. Uh, instead of calling for the wind, Madam Martha uses electric fan powered by mini hydroelectric. Now this makes her life a lot easier. The wind is consistent and blowing in one direction. The husks are lighter and get blown further away. Paddies can be stored for more than three to four years, so long they are kept dry. The farmers only remove the husks when they need the rice. Almost every household has a milling machine. There are three different types of Adam rice, the white, the red and the black varieties. Now, each variety has different taste, texture and flavour. Now, this is a red variety and is said to have lower glycemic value and suitable for those suffering from diabetes and is slightly more expensive than the white variety. They are sold at about two US dollars per kilo. Uh, I hope, I hope the price has become uh, this one is a higher, uh, good price because uh, once uh, more people knows the uh, the the rice of the this bakla land is better, then more people buy it. Scientists at Kazana Research believe in the untapped potential of Adan rice. There are over a thousand varieties of specialty of so-called heirloom rice in Malaysia, mostly in Borneo. Recent studies have proven that the varieties in Sabah and Sarawak are unique and it's something that Malaysia can offer to the world. They are very genetically uh, diverse, they are very uh, colourful in that sense, which means that they are at a biological level 
precious because when you have something that is like very different you have the potential to to um, market them as different different products it's important she said to have a seed bank so that these specialty rice do not lose their purity through crossbreeding the seeds are said to have a high germination rate and they can grow in almost any soil and terrain these are the eggs of golden snails, one of the worst enemies of rice farmers here. Now, the way to beat them is to raise the water level at paddy fields to flood them or release the ducks to feed on them. To improve the yield and to adapt to climate change, some farmers in Bakalalan have learned to employ the system of rice intensification, or SRI. Yang kami sekarang ikut SRI ini, dia punya air lebih kurang satu inci sejak dari uh, kurang air. Tapi mau jaga lah, sebab kalau dia kurang air, itu anak padi dia akan mengeluarkan anak padi yang banyak lah. Oh. Nah, jadi so dalam satu plot yang kecil, kita boleh ambil banyak lah daripada yang sistem oh. yang dulu punya itu. Harrison is among the younger generation of farmers who hopes to modernize rice farming through sustainable method and introduce it to the world. But the poor income and the aging demographics of farmers are constant hurdles. Tengo anak muda sekarang tidak berapa uh, suka pergi bikin sawah macam ni lah. Macam orang tua dulu. The current restrictions on rice movement across states is another stumbling block. And right now, um, we need special permission to export. Even though there's a license, you still need special permission. And you can't simply move rice across states. It's controlled. So because of that, we hope that the regulations can be updated to allow a carving out for these specialty rice. Let them grow, let them flourish. To do so, the Lumbawang themselves are actively promoting their Adan rice and their unique culture and cuisine within and outside the country. And this year's rice festival, he said, is extra special because the Bakalalan's Adan rice has finally gotten federal recognition. The Certificate of Geographical Identification, or GI, will allow the Lumbawang to protect the Adan rice and market their products better. Now, only producers in Bakalalan have the right to use the geographical identification labels to certify the origin of their goods with a short quality, reputation and characteristics. And this calls for celebration as villagers gather at Budok Noor to showcase their arts and crafts, their food and above all, their rice. What do you think? <laughs> After all the hard work, it's time to let the hair down and enjoy. Harapan saya selepas mendapat sertifikat GI, negara luar akan tahu Bakalan adalah pengeluar beras adan sebab beras adan adalah tanaman pusaka lun bawang di Bakalan. With their warm kinship and respect for nature, the Lumbawang people are now ready to share their heirloom with the rest of the world. Located just outside the capital city of Kuala Lumpur, this picturesque dairy farm spans across acres of grassland in Bangi, Selengok. These cattle are crossbreeds of Holstein Frisian, known as the world's highest producing dairy cow and heat tolerant Sahiwa cattle from Pakistan. Now they belong to main board listed Farm Fresh, one of the biggest dairy companies in Malaysia. Its group chief financial officer, Cairo Hassan, gave me a tour. Now, these crossbreeds, he said, are hardy and best suited for the hot and humid weather in Malaysia. Yeah. You don't need to spend a lot on air conditioning or if the breed is right, right? See the tags at the cows, right? It's actually an RFID tag. We monitor them using our dairy plan software. We t t track them, how well they do, how, many, how much milk they produce a day, uh, how many times they go to the clinic, for example, do they get sick often, and more importantly, uh, what's their fertility rate. 
Referred as ladies of the farm, they need plenty of rest. The barns are constantly ventilated with built-in water sprinkles to reduce the heat. Can you hear the soothing music? Now the airy and cooler temperature, as well as the occasional massage, are said to help the cows to relax and they in turn do better and produce more milk. Calves are nursed separately and fed warm milk twice a day. After two months, they are moved to the pen where they get to socialize with others. Now this is one of the few farms in Asia certified humane by the US certification body. Now every evening without fail, what these cows look forward to is to be able to roam freely and graze with others before their next milking session begins. First, the cows take a long shower to wash off the mud and the dirt before lining up for their turn at the milking parlour. The whole process takes about half an hour. The waste is treated and ploughed back to fertilise the grassland in line with sustainable farming practices. Now, growing alfalfa hay to counter the global supply chain disruption may be the next step for the company. Farm Fresh has over 40% share of the chilled ready-to-drink milk in the country, are expanding not just in Malaysia but overseas. Currently, it has five farms in the country, one in Australia. The journey in the past 12 years hasn't been easy, but it's a rewarding one, says its CFO. In the early days, it was very difficult to get people to, to even taste the milk because people have the conception that Oh, Malaysian milk, or for example, I want Australian milk. But once they taste the freshness of uh, a local breed dairy milk, then they are able to ascertain that the, the, the taste of milk tastes so much better. Uh, in Malaysia, consumption for fresh milk has been averaging an 8% growth since 2010, and it's set to increase further with children encouraged to drink more milk in schools. Now, meanwhile, consumers' dietary preferences are also changing, with more opting for fresh milk instead of condensed milk that's packed with sugar and all sorts of preservatives. The beginning stage of our restaurant, we've been only uh, taking around like 10 to 8 litres per day, and we have been running the restaurant for almost uh, two years plus, and uh, every day we are almost taking around like uh, 20, uh, 20 litres. So, which means the consumption is higher already. Our customers are coming in, so those days they used to consume like normal condensed milk, and now they are going more for a cow's milk. Even though the price is one and one ringgit and fifty cents higher, they don't mind. Shiban Ishwaran, who delivers fresh milk to the restaurant each morning, used to operate a small farm outside of Kuala Lumpur, but had to shut it down during the pandemic. It was a huge loss this time. Imagine two hundred liters one day. And we are stocking it up. No shops open the other that time. We could not go out for delivery or so. And people say that even the government said you cannot go here, we cannot go inside the condo. So customers also don't want to come out. So we had no choice, we had to throw the milk daily 200 liters, 100 liters. Because the milk, we are milking the cow daily. So that was a big issue for us. That time was very, very bad. So we even had to sell a few cows. With the restrictions lifted, Sivan Ishwaran hopes to restart the farm and produce fresh milk instead of buying from a middleman. But getting a bank loan is tough, he said. I asked Malaysia's Minister of Agriculture and Food Security on what sort of opportunities and financial help are available for these young agripreneurs. I call this encourage who have started the like farming. Whether a cow or sheep, they, they not enough money to grow up. We will find them that. While the ministry offers a 20,000 ringgit grant, that's about 4,500 US dollars for young agropreneurs, that isn't enough. Now he's urging banks to ease lending to promote agri-food in the street. Everywhere when I visit now, I will bring the agro-bank officer. We want like a farmer's bank in Thailand, not the only for the profit-oriented, but must go for the service-oriented. 
Under the National Agri-Food Policy 2.0, Malaysia aims to become self-sufficient in milk by year 2025, and currently less than half of close to 80 million litres of milk consumed yearly are produced locally. The rest is imported. Now, as big players join the milk bandwagon, more needs to be done to help the smaller farmers and breeders, not just to improve their livelihood, but also the farming practices to be more sustainable. Now, after the break, we take a look at the aquaculture industry, where there are pockets of success in developing an ecosystem that benefits smaller farmers. Located south of the capital Kuala Lumpur, near the seaside town of Port Dixon, lies the modest aquaculture farm, GK Aqua. A pioneer in freshwater aquaculture biotechnology, the company was formed to commercialize and improve the efficiency of freshwater prawn farming. Its CEO and founder, Giva Kupusami, said he has significantly improved the yield of giant freshwater prawns known as Udangala through RNAI or ribonucleic acid interference. It's really a biotechnology method to make just single sex prawns, which have 500% increased yield compared to conventional. So, what we have patented is really the sex marker to detect the male or female during the young age so that we can do the intervening process to knock the gene down or gene silencing so that the male become as a female, what we call in our term neo-females and then put into mating with normal males, they produce 100% male progenies. Here is where they mate. Now, male giant freshwater prawns are placed together with neo female in a shallow pond with a ratio of 1 to 5 for two weeks. On day 15, the prawns will be hauled up and inspected one by one. Now, the neo female prawns that are pregnant will be segregated and put in a separate pond where their eggs will be harvested. Over a thousand eggs are produced each cycle, and Kiva told me that a single male female usually goes through five to six cycles and can produce up to one ton of male giant freshwater prawns. These are his crown jewels. Each male female is priced at 20 US dollars and currently exported to the Middle East, Latin America, India, and Bangladesh. I wonder what happened to all the male eggs they produced? Well, after being harvested, they are moved to the in-house hatchery. It's so hot in here. What's the temperature like? So like surrounding water. temperature like 35, and the water temperature will heat like 30 to 31. The reason being because they need to be warmer so they can eat well, mm -hmm. so they grow fast, and also they need to go to molting. Mm -hmm. There's about 12 stages before they can metamorphosis into post larvae over 25 to 30 days. And then this is only 10. 10 day old, it's still at the larvae stage. Yes, that's right. The day old larvae can hardly be seen by the naked eye, but at 10 days old, their heads are starting to become visible. They are kept in hatchery for the next 30 days before being sold as post larvae to local farmers who will then grow them for about four to five months before selling them back to the farm. Leong Chang Ming has been farming udang gala for GK Aqua for over a year in his backyard. So Mr. Leong, yep. you've been rearing the giant freshwater prawns for two years now. Has yep. it been a lucrative venture so far? Definitely. Because uh, the demand is great in Malaysia. Uh, it's not only for the food market, uh, but it's also uh, very good demand for the prawn fishing market. There are currently about 40 independent farmers okay. like Mr. Leon. The cluster farming model, mm. to concentrate resource and democratize technology so that it's given to everyone to share and we create wealth and be an economic driver. 
Now, these are young Malaysian graduates participating in the three-month-long MUGA program, which stands for Malaysia Udangala Agropreneur. There will be a six-week in-the-classroom theory, followed by another six weeks of hands-on experience, ranging from feeding, the water quality, including the post-harvest handling of Udangala. So far, Giva has shortlisted 10 graduates to join his program. Through a buddy system, participants are paired up and given responsibility to handle three ponds each in his farm. 25-year-old Fidal's Amir is one of them. For me, uh, I like a uh, challenge, so I want to challenge myself, myself uh, how far can I go. So I want to take this challenge and inspire others. Fredaus and his partner stand to reap from the sale of prawns on top of monthly pay if they can hit the minimum output of 300 kilograms. Giba believes that the demand-driven system can be replicated in farming other freshwater fish like tilapia and patin. We have 21 more to be commercialised. So you can imagine what could be the potential. Like Malaysia have great biodiversity. The world growing from 7 billion to 9 billion. We need more food or, or new technological advancement to, to do more with less. Revolutionize the prawn farming to achieve the 5,000 metric ton in the next five years. While scaling up, Giva is also working on plant-based ingredients to feed the prawns. Now, in and around the farm, sesbanya plants, also known as vegetable hummingbird, are grown to produce pallets for udangala. These are leguminous, means they doesn't require any fertilizer. They fix nitrogen from the environment and they self-grow very fast. So from seed to tree, just four months. Then we have developed a proprietary technology mm. to make it become very high in protein mm. so they become very suitable to be fed to our udangala. Mm -hmm. But it's not as a direct source mm. so this is where you'll see later we are feeding that to a creature called black soldier fly, maggots. Yes, shall we go and have a look? Yeah, yeah sure. Hi. Well, she's the in-house R&B manager and also the nutritionist for the udangala or the giant freshwater prawns. Now, tell us about your secret recipe. Okay, our secret recipe here basically like we will air dry the leaf. So when we air dry the leaf, we will grind it into a powder, and then this powder we will be directly feeding to the BSF larvae. So this is the BSF larvae as you can see here, and then we will just feed until they can reach about like uh, day seven, as you can see here. So this BSF larvae, we also can be fed directly to the prawn, or we can formulate them into a pallet. Make into pallets. Yes. With fish stock depleting globally due to overfishing and climate change, transforming aquaculture by marrying biotech and science may be the answer to Malaysia's food security. Thank you.